Hi again. I want to carry on our conversation of communicating in a confined space. Now, we've looked at it in a sort of broad brushstroke kind of way, some broad principles of how to communicate well when you're in that confined space and tensions are rising. But I want to look at some specifics now that can help us, a few more details to give a few more examples and a few tools to help you to communicate well. You see, in many ways, communicating well, whether you're in a confined space or not, is all about speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth respectfully. Although the difficulty is that many people will say, I'm very happy at speaking the truth and I'll be very honest. It's just that there's no love in the way they're communicating. They're not communicating in a respectful way. Or other people can get lost in trying to be loving and respectful where they don't want to cause offense, so they fail to speak anything that's actually truthful. They're being dishonest by not communicating what's really going on for them. In fact, both forms of communication are dishonest forms of communication. So let's have a look at some tools that can help you to speak the truth in love, that can help you speak the truth respectfully. Now, one key I want us to look at before we get into this is a pitfall that most people fall into. It's something that we can fall into where we end up escalating the tension between us. And we do it so often and so readily that we don't realize we're doing it. And it's what a guy by the name of Marshall Rosenberg referred to as communicating in jackals. Now, as we know, a jackal is a dog, it's a wild beast. So when we communicate in jackals, we're communicating like the snarling beast, where we are leading with our teeth. So the form of communication that we're using is quite judgmental. We're interpreting another person's intentions, or we're interpreting or judging their character. And what we find is this just starts another argument. You see, it was Stephen Covey who said, we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions, but other people by their actions. Now, I think he's mostly right. I would say that we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions, but we judge others by our interpretation of their actions. And so what these, these jackals, these interpretations look like, is where we might say, you're selfish, you're lazy, you're insensitive, you're uncaring, you don't care about me, you're, you're rejecting me, you're not listening to me. Or the classics, you always and you never. And you see, these are forms of jackals where we are judging or we're interpreting another person's intentions or their characters. And this tends to start another argument, or at least it escalates the current one. So if a person said, you've left all these dishes out overnight, you're obviously just so lazy, you don't care about me at all, you just want me to be your slave. Well, we have a number of jackals there. When the person is labelled as being lazy, that they don't care about me, and you want me you want to, me to be your slave. All of those are jackals. And you see, what they will end up doing usually is starting a second argument. A second argument about whether uh, that person thinks they really are lazy. Hey, I'm not lazy. Yeah, I left these out overnight, but I do so much around the house. A second argument about whether I really care about you. Yeah, of course I care about you. Yeah, I left dishes out, but that doesn't mean I don't care about you. Look at the way I love you. I always tell you I love you or I do these other things. Or that I actually want you to be my slave. Why would you ever think that? I never said that. I'm not saying that. So you're all wrong. And so we start a second argument. And we just escalate things. So it's important to get our head out of assuming the way another person is being, of what they mean by that. We we'll get our head out of judging that other person's intentions or interpreting their actions and coming back to what is concrete between us, the action, the actual behavior without interpreting it. 
You see, what's concrete in that scenario, in that example, is that the dishes weren't done. Now, that's true. The meaning, the intention, that's a whole other story. So a couple of ways of handling this. The first way is simply to notice without interpreting and then to communicate your preference. So you might say, hey, I noticed that the dishes were left out or the dishes weren't done or the dishes were left on the bench. That's just a noticing, especially when you do it in a matter of fact kind of way. There isn't intention, uh, in, sorry, there isn't intensity in your voice. I noticed that the dishes were left out. There, there isn't something else you're trying to communicate. All you're doing in a matter of fact way is communicating what is. Hey, I noticed that the dishes weren't done last night. And then you communicate your preference. Your preferences, uh, I would really prefer if they could be done before you come to bed. I'd really prefer if they could be tidied away um, before morning. Now, that's you speaking the truth in a respectful way. Now, the other person may want to bring a different point of view and they may want to negotiate about when dishes are done. Well, that's fine because now you're going to negotiate and whatever you end up with that you are truly in agreement with, well, then problem solved. Another framework that I use here, especially when things get a bit more tense, is the appreciation framework. What I appreciate, what I don't appreciate, what I would appreciate. Now, in many ways, this is the reverse of the jackal. You see, when you communicate about what I appreciate, you're talking about what I appreciate about your side. What I appreciate about your intention, your goodwill, your character, your heart, your efforts. Hey, I can appreciate that we haven't spoken about this before. Hey, I can appreciate that you're under a lot of pressure right now. Hey, I can appreciate that you had to stay up really late to get that job done. So we talk about what we can genuinely appreciate about another person's point of view. Then we share our side. You see, when we start by what I appreciate about your side, we're communicating, I'm not against you. We can appreciate, I get your side in all of this. And now we share our side, what I, what I don't appreciate. Or a softer way of saying that is what I struggle with or what I'm concerned about. Hey, what, I, what I'm struggling with here is that when the dishes are left out, then they're left for me to do in the morning because I can't get on with the day. I can't get into the kitchen. I can't think straight until they are done. And then we share what I would appreciate. So what I would appreciate is if you can make sure that the dishes are taken care of and tidied up before you come to bed. Or what I can appreciate is, look, if you do have to stay up really late and you've done some dishes, if you can just put them to one side so I know you're going to handle them in the morning and it just gives me space, I would find that really helpful. So what I appreciate, what I don't appreciate, and what I would appreciate. And again, like I shared in the communicating in a confined space, doing all of that as best you can with softness in your voice and softness in your tone. And so if you try to speak with soft eyes, it will usually mean that your voice responds and speaks softly as well. But you may need to take some deep, slow breaths to get your tone just right. And then describe what you're seeing. Don't interpret it. Come back from the jackals. They only escalate the situation and share what you prefer. Or communicate that you're for the other person with what you appreciate, what, you're, what you don't appreciate or what you're struggling with, and what you would appreciate. As you practice that, and it does take practice, you usually find that you can communicate far more effectively, far more well, whether you're in a confined space or not.